Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. The readings for this week, the ninth Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on July 30th, 2023. Our first reading is 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 5 through 12. The continuous reading is from Genesis chapter 29, verses 15 through 28. Our psalm is the 119th psalm. The portion we'd be reading is 129 through 136. Our epistle is from Romans, as we continue now with chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. And in this year of Matthew, we read now chapter 13, verses 31 through 33, and 44 through 52. And I just love that um, Jesus loves to tell story and Matthew notices. Um, I think a week or so ago that was you, Matt, but in this particular verse right here, uh, the gospel writer says, uh, Jesus um, was telling them once again another parable, and we have a few right here. Uh, before us, including the one that we're so familiar with, uh, the mustard seed parable. I um, I want to admit I grew up on the mustard seed parable, and um, the idea uh, which was often conveyed was uh, the size of my faith. Um, but a couple of weeks ago, we discussed how Jesus is is talking to fishers and farmers and shepherds and Sadducees and prostitutes and Pharisees. And in today's divided world, I wonder if pastors might consider how their words form a community, and that community is formed around the promises of God. And uh, those promises were made known in Jesus. And so that community that is formed would would be as diverse as the cultures in context. Uh, I want to say in our zip codes, but that might be the problem, um, is that our zip codes don't represent the diversity. And if there's any place that has a mandate to be that diverse, it's the community of faith. And I think here Jesus is demonstrating that by who he wants to hear the fullness of the promises of God. All right. Now we can get into the exegesis. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. It's great to have all these short ones clustered together like this. The the challenge is not imagining that they all say the same thing, right? Each one has got its own dynamics, its own silliness and its own scandal and all of those things. And so I think for a preacher, you need to choose which ones you want, unless you want to do, you know, a couple minutes on, on each of the five, but that can get confusing. And then the question is, so what? Is it just to figure them out or uh, or what? But it's um, there's enough in each of these to, to digest for a while in the course of a single sermon. Yeah, I like, I like that idea, Matt. I think trying to cover all five of them is, is maybe in, in kind of ways sort of counter homiletical in that you know, part of the part of the experience of parables is their diversity, like you were talking about, Joy. And so, you know, what what where where do people kind of land? You know, what where what's what's drawing their attention? And and maybe it, that that's where the preacher starts. Like, what parable, what parable pulls you in, and gives you an imagination for what the kingdom of heaven is like and why. Uh, especially as you think about your congregation and what and what they need to hear, and so uh, taking you know taking one parable and really working that parable and with the the kind of imagery that we're invited into, and then what what then what does that mean for how we imagine uh, imagine the kingdom of God? And so uh, so you have the mustard seed, and then and then the you know the shelter and the home for all the birds. I mean that's a lovely you know, that's a lovely image of the kingdom of heaven or the searching and the joy uh, that comes with, uh, that comes with 
discovering and finding the kingdom of heaven. And so there's, yeah, there's some just lovely themes that you can, you can uh, settle in on. I think another thing I think about when it comes to these parables is maybe inviting the congregation, not necessarily in that moment, but inviting them to what parable would they tell Mm -hmm. uh, about the kingdom of heaven? If somebody asks them, you know, uh, tell me about the kingdom of heaven. Well, the kingdom of heaven is like, uh, what might, how might they, so maybe a sermon does a little bit of that too, in terms of, you know, landing on one parable, but then inviting the listeners to think, yeah, how would, how would you, what would your, what would your parable be? How would you tell the story of the kingdom of heaven? What is it like? And that might be uh, that might be kind of fun for people. To think about. It's so one of the one of the exercises that we offer in our preaching class um, is asking that question. You know, how do you describe the kingdom of God? Which is what Jesus, particularly in these parables, is regularly doing. Always finding ways to describe what God's intent for creation and for the cosmos and for community is. And so this what Wesleyan itinerant likes to see that it's about a woman doing a mundane task and it's about a buyer uh, assess, uh, uh, acquiring another asset. Uh, it's about the leaders. It's about um, the losers. It's about, you know, what, what, what language, uh, uh, like you say, Caroline, What language would we use in our context to get people to hear the character of God that is forming a community where people find joy, where people are um, moved to seek, where people are, uh, to use your word, uh, Matt, they recognize the scandal that this isn't what I thought it was going to be. Um, I love that idea, Caroline. Yeah, I'd want to make sure that everybody knows that uh, there's there's some shadiness or some some unscrupulousness in all of these, or just some weirdness. Mm-hmm. At least in the first four, um, the way Jesus describes the mustard seed and a tree would probably make some people giggle a little bit. Like, I don't think Jesus realizes that there are better trees out there <laughs> than the mustard shrub. Uh, the woman who actually hides the yeast doesn't mix it, but actually hides it. There's something kind of stealthy about that, or maybe she's corrupting mm-hmm. um, from the perspective of others. The, mm-hmm. you know, somebody who finds a treasure and then, you know, hides it in the field, something a little unscrupulous about that. You know what I mean? There's kind of, it's, we talked about Jacob a couple of weeks ago, right? This is like Jacob kind of behavior. Mm-hmm. Um, who sells everything for a single pearl? That's just, it's a little dumb. <laughs> if your job is a pearl merchant, um, right, to put everything into one. And that, I think that's part of the point is that the kingdom will uh, will operate under different values and will make you do things that will, uh, will cause your neighbors and family to wonder if you're okay. Yeah. And I also... The, that la- you know the last part of of course this section of you know the weeping and the and the gnashing of teeth and uh, the angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous. I think there's a tendency for people to hear that on a personal level, mm-hmm. like it's going to separate the bad people and the good people. Uh, and I think that one of the maybe. I'm not saying that that's maybe not not what Jesus is saying, but one of the things of hearing this in the context of describing the kingdom of heaven is that when we think about and have an imagination for the kingdom of heaven, then what things don't belong anymore? Right, right. Uh, what structures, what institutions, what uh, you know, what what reality, what systems, right? Sinful systems of humanity simply don't, yeah. Are, can't be here anymore, and I think that's another invitation uh, with with these parables that one could go because we have yeah we have such a tendency to individualize that mm-hmm. you know oh it's I'm going to be cast out of the uh, kingdom and it's no it's really when we sift through and when we think about what 
what are like the characteristics of God? You said, Joy, what are the characteristics of the kingdom? Then there, yeah, there are certain things that don't belong. And how do we name those things? And based on what we have discovered about what the kingdom of heaven is like. And so that uh, offers us places or invitation to discernment of naming the things that are uh, that are not representative of God's kingdom. Yeah, some of this goes back. Go ahead, Joy. No, go ahead. Man. I was just going to say some of this goes back to early chapters in Matthew when uh, I think the way Matthew present John, one of the things that John is doing is announcing a reckoning. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the coming of Jesus is the promise of a reckoning, which in the, well, we've, we've been conditioned to think, oh, that's bad news. That's going to be punishment for me or something. And maybe it will be. But uh, <laughs> but the you know, who longs for a reckoning, right? Mm-hmm. What, who are the people who long to see the truth be told? Um, and for the damaging things in this creation to be cast out. And that's that's this promise. I think it's also the promise of the of the parable of the dragnet here that uh, one the kingdom of God is like this scooping up and then sorting out. It's a promise uh, that one day the truth will be told. And like you said, Caroline, certain things have to go if indeed righteousness and justice and peace are going to flourish. And the marked difference of the countercultural nature of what um, we think the kingdom is and how kingdoms run and how throughout all of scripture, the narrative is the kingdoms of this world are not representative of what God's kingdom is. And if there's anything that's scandalous in the message that Jesus brings, it's what you were expecting it's what how you thought you were going to build or create this kingdom. How you thought God was going to act is not power over, but an extension of invitation to all. It's not um, uh, ruling so that there's a line divided between who's in and who's out, but it's grace so that those lines become blurred when people seek to be a recipient of the promise of God. And that promise isn't what we think of in terms of power and prosperity. It is a peace that we just can't wrap our mind around and thank God for the spirit who gives us understanding of what that is. Which might be a good segue. I was going to say that. Because otherwise, I th- yeah these these next few weeks are it's the the thematic Old Testament reading and is is a little bit hard sometimes to figure out what what the RCL committee had in mind with making these connections. Uh, but but uh, as you just said, Joy, we pray for a discerning mind <laughs> mm-hmm. and exactly. wisdom, you know, kingdom wisdom, if you will. Uh, to to be able to to note and to identify the you know the righteous and the righteousness acts of righteousness among us. So and the, that's and the yeah. presence of the spirit. You know, I, as I've begun, I'm looking out for practices of hospitality. Right, so I'm particularly drawn to how Solomon, um, in an initial display of wisdom, <laughs> asked for wisdom, uh, demonstrates compassion, um, because his desire is to understand the community over which he's been given charge. And, and that his understanding was not merely cultural or political or ethnic or economic, the caste and class lines that we draw. But the request from God, the prayer becomes allow me to receive a perspective that is God's heart that I would seek to govern from the perspective of God's good. And that makes that the perfect segue from the kingdom of this world is not the kingdom of God. And I'm grateful for that. Yeah, I'd say also let's notice that that Solomon's 
request is not just make me smarter, but it's this idea of discerning between good and evil, which goes back to to the garden in Genesis, uh, of course, and but also connects to the way we were talking about that parable of the dragnet and easy for people to hear about God sorting the good and the bad and think, well, I know exactly what's going or who's going, you know, or what systems or what institutions. Uh, and Solomon's prayer is perhaps a reminder that, that one of the things that we lack sometimes is an ability to discern between good and evil um, or that our motives get perverted. Not to say we don't have some really good ideas sometimes and not right. to say that there aren't some evils that are quite plain and quite obvious. I'm not, mm-hmm. I'm not making a, a both sides argument here, but it's to show, I think, that especially for somebody who's walking into a position of power, the way power sometimes corrupts our ability to make those discernments and to figure out how to rightly adjudicate um, between good and evil. And it's a it's a it's a marked statement to compare that as you did to um, uh, to Genesis and, and to the, the tree. What is your choice? Is your choice is our choice to know what is good is and evil, or to allow the Spirit of God to enable us to discern on God's terms what is good and what is evil. Um, I think that tie back is the thread again that is throughout this narrative. What is the character of God and what kind of community is God forming? Am I on a roll? Okay, I'm on a roll. I'll stop. <laughs> You're on no. a roll. I just want to hear you apply that question to uh, to Genesis 29. Oh. To Genesis 29? Well, tell me what in the world are we going to do with this? What in no. the world is this story me- going to tell us about God? Let me just say one one thing before we move to Genesis, and that is, we it just it's it's an obvious reminder. But when we when we have these conversations, particularly around in in the Gospel of Matthew with regard to discernment of the kingdom of heaven and the qualities of the kingdom of heaven and and God's promises and God's character, uh, that that to remind ourselves that Jesus has already given a, kind of a litmus test for this, right in the in the Beatitudes, you know, the Sermon on the Mount. And so, you know, if we're wondering, well, what is, what are, how do we test these things? How do we discern? Uh, how, you know, where is, where is it that the Sermon on the Mount, where is it that the Beatitudes come into play and say, well, is this, is this, you know, is this something that hungers for righteousness or not? Is this something that, uh, that is um, care for the meek? And so, we're not we're not floating in <laughs> unknowns. We have been given some uh, some direction in this, and and some theological uh, what's theologically at stake. So, just a reminder of that. Yeah, it's a good interpretive rule. Yep. Go back I there. really yeah. impre- appreciate that. Yeah, we're not completely lost. We're, but, we're, we're not, we're not. We still need um, to pray for a discerning mind, but you know, Jesus has said a few things that we could remember, which would be a good idea. Anyway, the, maybe the, building, the example, the example of Solomon reminds us to seek God for discernment. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and that's, that's the interpretive mood that, that I think you're talking about, interpretive yeah. mode that you're talking about, Caroline, that, that, Throughout each place that we land in a scene or an episode, we have this overarching theological um, expression of what is God's intention for the world. Um, and, and when I look at, at 39, uh, a, again, in the midst of uh, these episodes of Jacob's life, um, I'm, I'm again struck by the example of a dysfunctional family. Um, and um, th- we were talking just a moment ago about this dividing between, you know, who's in and who's out, who's right and who's wrong. It's easy to focus on the single character and to make one more distasteful than the other, especially as we go through these stories in Genesis and particularly the story in Jacob's uh, journey. Um, but uh, I wonder if that theological thread or that um, hermeneutical idea is um, 
that what we are doing here is looking into the consequences of brokenness and the, the consequences of broken relationships. So a broken relationship with God, when we are not seeking God to discern what God's reign, going back to the kingdom of God, what God's community would look like, that that estrangement for God results in estrangement even from our family. And so this 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 episode begins with uh, Laban saying, you know, just because you're my family, um, and then it's this is a description of brokenness. It's not an example of business savvy. Um, and and I would encourage our preachers to focus to to paraphrase what you you were saying uh, just a moment ago on an intrusion of God's grace like we see in the Beatitudes, um, that God's healing, God's a glimpse of God's promise of peace has shown up. And now on the mountain, Jesus speaks of it. Well, I would encourage preachers to focus on the need in our dysfunctional communities for the intrusion of God's grace to restore a community of hospitality and I'll do this and then stop and we can we can we can parse through with with uh chapter 39 of Genesis but it actually points to the promise of Paul's letter uh to the Romans um both the spirit and the promise of the peace uh so so that hermeneutical thread um of the of a theological understanding of God that you call us to Caroline it is what I see in this text that's how I would answer your question, Matt. Yeah. There, Good. yeah, there certainly are dysfunctional elements in what's going on here. What worries me are the elements that aren't dysfunctional um, <laughs> in terms of how they represent uh, life in antiquity. You know what I mean? Like, the I mean, Leah's just the joke of this whole thing, right? Like, ah, uh, you know, one's got one has weak eyes. The other one's lovely and form and beautiful. And so, of course, Jacob's going to get tricked into, you know, marrying the one that's not as attractive and all. I mean, it's just, I wish that were abnormal <laughs> in the ancient world or in certain societies. Um, yeah. Or but the it's contemporary the, it's the, world. The norm, the exactly, world. right? So that's what kind of, you know, to get the story, you have to get the way in which Leah's the, the, the joke here. I just don't know what to do with that. Fine. I mean, I get, I, I understand where the Bible comes from. I understand the Bible's got, got stuff, but, um, but yeah, I, I would think a, a preacher wants to talk about the ways in which a lot of what goes on in this story as well is perfectly within the kind of the mainstream of some ancient norms around family and marriage and, and so on. And the continuity, um, because I, you know, I think about what was that? What was that old thing where you you swipe right, swipe left? If you know, if you're looking at a face to find out if this is a good thing, that's what comes to mind. I think you're talking about. I think you're talking about Tinder. One of one of those. Yeah. Um, but but it's the same thing. We still find a way to make certain looks, certain um, certain uh, people, certain individuals, certain. Um, cast or class, the joke, right? And so it's true in the ancient world. And the reason that this is a, a, a living word is because we're, it's true for us too. Um, the other side of that um, is the fact that if I want to make Laban out to be a bad guy, I got to make him out to be a good father. Because he found a way to say, you know, this kid is not going to notice that this is a good daughter I have here. And so I'm going to find a way to make sure that she gets what she deserves. So it's it's a horrible business practice. It's a savvy business practice. And the horror in my choice of using business is to remind us that in the ancient culture, Marriage was more of a business proposal, and that's that's the ancient world and the displacement of women. Um, that that I think you're you're wanting us to uh, wanting us not to forget, Matt. And I just don't want us to write off the past as as if we've gotten it right. 
because I oh. think our caste and class system is just as divisive and just as wounding, just as dysfunctional. And so we want to offer um, this intrusion of God's grace as hope, uh, as, a, as a believable promise that what we see now is not what God intends for us. No, that's all. I, I, I think I, yeah, it, it, what you've both said, I agree. You know, it's this, it's this dysfunction, which is a part of all families. Uh, that's our reality, but, but it also is a, it, it shines a mirror on elements of, of relationships and navigating contracts and, and the kinds of values that we hold up still in terms of, of choosing a, a mate, <laughs> choosing a partner and, you know, um, like, yeah, but, you know, go on Twitter and you've got filters for, uh, you know, that make you look like you're a movie star and, um, and Five so, so much, yeah, so much of those elements are so, are just so present and, um, and so it makes it, it does make it hard to find the theological promise in this because, um, that I don't know that somehow God manages to work through all of that. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. So the power of the preached word here is attending to what Matt has lifted up allows us uh, to tell this episode um, with all of its hopelessness, with all of its, uh, how it, it, it crosses all the boundaries that, um, offend our sensitivities to lift up that that brokenness is there and to to critique it um, so we can do a heavy hand there. Um, but what I want us to do is to not to lose that it becomes a metaphor that the slap that we just gave, whether we, we choose to slap Jacob or Laban or the ancient culture is the slap we need to give to ourselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, yeah. and, and so by recognizing the ancient world and putting it up against some of the improvements that we've made, um, we get to dive deep into the dysfunctions and name it. Uh, and then describe that that isn't that, that, you know, if if I segue here, I would say the psalmist laments other people's sins. And I love that the commentator says, and of course, also her own, meaning the psalmist's own. Um, and the, the, the commentator for our Psalm 19, 119 says, sin is not an occasion for blame or shame or gossip but for tears. And I think that might also be a hermeneutical move as we look at the, the 29th chapter of Genesis to be faithful to the text is to have that kind of compassion that the psalmist um, highlights. Will you let me that, do that segue? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was going to uh, bring the psalm in earlier, actually, and in... in how we were talking about prayer for discernment and prayer mm -hmm. for following God's, you know, God's precepts and, and having the, having the, the gift of that kind of wisdom. And so I would, uh, I would use this Psalm somehow liturgically, if you were going down that route, like maybe ending the, your sermon with this Psalm as a mm -hmm. prayer, let us pray. Uh, wow. that, and so rather than having the Psalm read earlier, uh, or it could be the opening prayer to a sermon, but how could you incorporate into a sermon that had that focus? That's how I would. That's how I would use the psalm this week. I love the idea of ending that with a, as a prayer. That th there's some powerful lines in that that would fit behind yeah. either of these texts. Yeah, yeah, that's my idea. Romans. You should be Presbyterian. We have we have uh, prayers of illumination before the scripture reading. Uh, yeah, so yeah. You, you could use it as a prayer of illumination. Just saying, one more Absolutely. great idea we've got. Absolutely, all for it. <laughs> we 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 Wesleyans attend attend 
occasionally do that in our Methodist services. All right. Romans 8. Oh. So uh, you might have to recall what was happening last week in terms of the talk about the spirit and the notion of all creation groaning. And now this God's own spirit is amongst us uh, doing the same thing, groaning. It's the same, it's a cognate, right? Of the same verb here. So one of the things the spirit is sent for, according to Paul, is to, to aid us in our dissatisfaction <laughs> Uh, or to express God's own dissatisfaction uh, with the current state of affairs, right? And to yearn for the fulfillment um, of all things. And so then, right, Paul goes to, um, I guess, find the doxology, which um, will also open the door to the next three weeks um, in Romans. If you're helping people keep score at home, uh, or at least map their way through this. But people just simply need to know that, <clears throat> that, uh, that verses 31 through 38 exist mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they need to know where to find it. I mean, if there's, yep. if there's anything people should go home with from a sermon on, on Romans, as part of Romans eight, it's to know where to find this and to know this promise and to know that it speaks to them themselves as well. Um, and it, yeah, I, I think that is such an important point, Matt, that, there are certain passages that people need to know where they are. Uh, and because if you think about uh, particularly, you know, those last two verses, 37 and 38, uh, well, uh, well, really 38, right? That there is absolutely nothing. And the way in which the way in which our human tendency is to say, well, that must separate me from God or that, has to separate me from God. Or there's this meme or not meme, but something going around on Facebook that, you know, God, God did not send the son, God did not send God's son to condemn, nor did God send you, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and I, and nothing can separate us from the love of God yet how much we try to, either we try to separate others from the love of God, or we think what, this is the moment where we are separated from the love of God, whatever that, whatever, whatever that ends up being. And, I, uh, and I, you know, I couldn't help but think about in this moment, um, you know, just, just for, I'm convinced that neither death and that's where I just stop because of, you know, with thinking about my dad still like dad, you know, you are not separated from the love of God. That's that. Being, being able to say that promise and to believe in that promise is, is a balm in moments of that particular grief. The psalmist highlights the word, and for Christ followers, the gospel highlights the word made flesh, and it becomes embodied in Jesus' words and way of life. Here, Paul highlights the spirit, which is that wisdom of Solomon that is the creator God. And so God is so present here in Paul's discourse. And it's a radical assurance that in the present realities of the Roman Empire, the oppression, the, um, the longing, the loss, the loneliness of, of our existence, that we have this radical assurance that, as you remind us, nothing can separate us from the love of God.